Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Aaron Markovich. I'm executive director of Maryland Milestones, Anacostia Trails Heritage Area. This is um, one of our regular um, monthly programs on a variety of historical topics. Um, you may have been to a few of the programs with Susan Pearl um, and her presentations. Uh, she'll be returning next month with a program on paintings at Riversdale Mansion. Uh, but this month, because we are celebrating uh, the passage of uh, women's suffrage uh, rights, uh, we have had a couple of different speakers. We had Sarah Marsum uh, last week doing a crafting program, and she'll actually be returning in October uh, with the second half of her program due to a couple of scheduling difficulties. Uh, and tonight we have Casey, and we'll talk a little more about her in a moment. Uh, but first, we're going to do my traditional plug for Maryland Milestones and who we are and what it is that we do. Uh, as a few bits of housekeeping items, video is be re being recorded and will be available about uh, a day, two days after, uh, and we'll post it on our YouTube channel. We always take a little bit longer just to make sure uh, in case we have a lot of technical difficulties that we can clean that up. Um, your audio and video is turned off, uh, but you can submit questions through the question box. And um, Grace, um, I think she might appear for a moment uh, here. Um, Grace Davenport, our trail tourism program manager. There's Grace, hi. She's gonna be behind the scenes and handling questions and answers, and she'll return at the end of the program uh, with questions for Casey. So please be sure to put those questions in there. Thank you, Grace. Um, Maryland Milestones, uh, also known as Anacostia Trails Heritage Area, Inc., or AFA, is a state certified heritage area, one of 13 in the state of Maryland, that encompasses the Northern Prince George's County region uh, with about 17 communities. We have a budget of about 200,000 and a staff of one full-time and two part-time plus one volunteer social media manager. We manage uh, to hit on the topics of history, art, culture, and natural resources. And that oftentimes includes trails and trail users, um, which is part of Grace's job. Uh, we also provide grants via the state program to nonprofits and partners. We also provide technical assistance and partnership building. There's a map of our region, the northern Prince George's area. As you can see, everything from Hyattsville, where our main office is located, uh, all the way to Laurel and then over to Bowie. So really encompassing that northern Prince George's area. The other part-time person in our staff, uh, Kirsten Falk, is working on a project that may look at the idea of expanding the heritage area across the entire county. Um, as mentioned, our office is in Hyattsville. It's located within the Pyramid Atlantic Art Center um, and our Maryland Milestones Heritage Center, that car's not there anymore, unfortunately, uh, is a great place to come and get information. The building is open Wednesdays through Sundays. Um, and so any hours that Pyramid Atlantic is open, we're open. Um, and of course, you can always find us online as well at MarylandMilestones.org. All right, that's enough of that. So tonight's speaker is Casey Roan. She uh, is currently a preservation planner with Montgomery Planning Office. Uh, she's a 2017 graduate of the University of Maryland in a dual program, both historic preservation and community planning. And while she was uh, doing work with the Maryland Historical Trust, she was researching place-based history of women's suffrage, um, uncovering about 50 sites around the state where Maryland women fought for the right to vote, including right here on US-1, and that's what we're learning about tonight. She is, of course, also a member of our board of directors, and so we're very thrilled to have her here tonight. So uh, we'll do a quick technical change, and I will have uh, Casey pop up here. All right, Casey, there you go. How's it looking, Aaron? Looks great. Okay, perfect. Well, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me here uh, tonight to talk with you. So we've picked a fortunate day for the uh, the program tonight. Today is actually the 100th anniversary of the day that the Tennessee legislature ratified the 19th Amendment. So um, this is one of the days that's considered the anniversary, as is next Wednesday, August 26th, which is the day that the 19th Amendment was actually certified as part of the U.S. Constitution by the Secretary of State. So we have a, a fortuitous day here to talk about the women's suffrage movement. Um, and this was obviously a, a really significant milestone for American women. Um, this victory was the result of, of decades of um, really committed organizing, 
and political campaigning. Uh, but it, it, was, uh, it was a flawed victory and an imperfect one that left women of color behind. And in Maryland, uh, especially, it, it uh, perpetuated racist attitudes and policies. So tonight, we are going to talk about the March of the Army of the Hudson, which was a February 1913 suffrage demonstration in which a group of New York suffragists walked from New York all the way to Washington, D.C. in February of 1913, which sounds, you know, pretty unpleasant. Um, this was a march of over, you know, 200 miles on um, dirt roads that were, were not meant um, for that sort of campaign. So um, this was a uh, carefully planned action that was meant to coincide with the inauguration of the new president, Woodrow Wilson. Um, the suffragists planned to present him with a letter demanding that he take action uh, on women's suffrage as the new president. Um, and of course, um, their route brought them right through Maryland. So they spent um, almost a week here in the state making various stops um, as they passed through the state on their way to the capital. And their experience in the state here, um, it highlights their determination in pursuit of their cause. It was not an, an easy journey, um, but it also reflects the racism that permeated the movement and Maryland's, you know, frankly, mixed feelings towards women's suffrage. So first, what I want to do is place the, um, the march in the context of the uh, broader women's suffrage movement and what was happening at that time. So this march is one example of women increasingly using their, their physicality and athleticism to support their cause. This was a grueling, arduous hike in very, very poor conditions. And it was meant to show their commitment and draw attention to their campaign, which it very successfully did. Um, and by demonstrating their, their strength and toughness, women sought to show their capability and their reliability. So at this time, you begin to see women undertaking all sorts of public pursuits for the cause. Um, you saw suffrage mountaineers who, uh, they climbed Mount Rainier um, to plant a suffrage flag at the summit in 1909. Uh, there were women aviators who dropped suffrage flyers. Um, and there were suffrage swimmers who, uh, who sort of linked their bodily freedom, their ability to swim in bathing costumes that weren't like a heavy full body suit. They linked this bodily freedom to their political and social freedom. So the, the March of the Army of the Hudson can really be seen as one in a series of increasingly um, bold physical actions by women in pursuit of the right to vote. We should also talk about uh, you know, what was happening in Maryland's suffrage movement at the time. So Maryland, at, by this point, had had an active suffrage movement since about 1889. Um, and there was pretty highly organized network of statewide suffrage organizations um, and coordinated political campaigns and attempts to demand that the Maryland legislature support women's suffrage. Uh, Maryland even hosted the 1906 National Convention of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, which was held at the Lyric Theater in Baltimore. But the movement here really hadn't made much headway. Um, it faced a very hostile political climate that was led by an entrenched uh, political Democratic Party establishment that was fundamentally opposed to expanded voting rights. The state had fought the 1870 ratification of the 15th Amendment, which granted voting rights to black men, and it had defeated every effort to expand voting rights to women. This was you know, really essentially motivated by racism. Uh, Democrats did not want to grant voting rights to African-American women who were more likely than not at this time to register as Republicans. Um, or they, and they also didn't want to shake their grip on the power by disrupting the status quo. So in response to this, uh, Maryland suffragists ended up taking quite a hypocritical posture in response, arguing on the one hand that the right to vote was a fundamental freedom, but on the other hand that African Americans didn't deserve it. And some of the state suffragists even went so far as to argue that voting rights could easily be taken away from black women and men using Jim Crow measures that were popular in Southern states. <laughs> 
at the federal level, um, the suffrage campaign was increasingly moving towards calls for, for federal action on women's suffrage, as opposed to asking you know, individual state legislatures or city governments to enfranchise women. Um, the suffragists were beginning to push for a federal constitutional amendment. Um, so in 1912, um, just before the march of the Army of the Hudson, um, the Democratic National Convention was held at the Fifth Regiment Armory in Baltimore. And Maryland's suffragists made a really concerted effort to try to get the Democratic Party to place a woman's suffrage plank in the party platform. Um, and their, unfortunately, their efforts failed. Um, the Republican Party similarly did not adopt a woman's suffrage plank. And in November of 1912, Woodrow Wilson went on to win the presidency. And so the suffragists planned uh, a large demonstration in response to his election. They wanted to hold him to account for his failure to support women's suffrage. And so the, the first big piece of this was the March of the Army of the Hudson. These New York suffragists planned to carry a suffrage letter from New York to Washington and deliver it to President Wilson um, on the day before his inauguration. And this would coincide with a massive suffrage parade planned for the same day in which 5,000 women were going to march in organized formation um, um, to, to call attention to this campaign. And so the army is led by uh, General Rosalie Jones. She is a Long Island native who had been born to a wealthy family, but was sort of an iconoclast. Uh, she earned a law degree and, and frequently clashed with her family over her sort of uh, you know atypical pursuits. And she was really inspired by the British women suffragettes who were taking really bold public action at this time. And on the right, I know that's not the best picture, but unfortunately, that's the only one I can find. This is Emily Dutch. She was a 1906 um, Goucher College graduate who, oh, she, I guess she graduated from Goucher earlier than that. She graduated in 1906 from the University of Maryland Law School. She was a really early um, woman law school graduate. But unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of work for women lawyers at this time. So she went to become a reporter for the Baltimore News. And she joined the Army of the Hudson as a war correspondent. So this was the name that they gave to the sort of you know group of reporters that joined them on their route from New York to Washington. And she traveled with the army the entire way and contributed to this really frenzy of media coverage that the march received. Um, and it was this uh, you know, approach of having these reporters attached to the army was highly effective in getting out basically constant coverage of what the Army of the Hudson was doing and really drumming up a ton of attention and enthusiasm for, for their march. So on February 20th, the Army of the Hudson crossed the Maryland line in Cecil County, just north of Elkton. And uh, immediately, so, you know, first they were very excited. Rosalie Jones purportedly knelt in the soil and, and clutched a handful of dirt and, and blessed the Maryland soil for the cause of women's suffrage. But their road through Maryland was not an easy one. Um, immediately they began to face challenges. Um, they claimed repeatedly that the Maryland roads were the worst that they had encountered on their entire journey down the eastern seaboard. Um, they were frequently confronted with just these, you know, sucking mud pits that forced them to go way out of their way through neighboring fields. Um, the baggage car kept getting stuck in the mud and it caught fire several times. So they were having a lot of logistical difficulties. And then on top of that, this was the first and only Southern state of their journey and the most conservative leg that they would face. As they began to pass through um, the counties of Northeast Maryland, they were told um, that they shouldn't march on Sundays or they would offend people. Um, and they were told that, you know, white ladies couldn't possibly go to the polls with black women. And they were also told that they would finally have to confront the race question, uh, one which they had been able to avoid thus far. Essentially, what was the plan for, for black women? Would they be allowed to vote um, just as white women were? And this was a really problematic question that plagued um, not only the, the Maryland movement, but you know, also at the national level as well. And um, the Army of the Hudson had been able to avoid this question so far, but given the fraught uh, racial climate in Maryland at this time, it seemed likely that they wouldn't be able to avoid it here. So we'll pick up their journey on February 
26. So they had by this point passed through uh, Baltimore County and Baltimore City. They had just spent two nights in Baltimore. And at nine o'clock in the morning on February 26, they set out um, on the march to Laurel, which was a 22 mile walk. Um, and so I've tried to highlight the, um, the route that they would have taken here. Obviously this keeps going south past Laurel, um, but this is a 1912 uh, roadmap of the area. So um, they, they first stopped um, in Elkridge where they had lunch. They had some tea and, and biscuits in the church hall there. Um, and then finally, they eventually, after you know, 22 miles, straggled into Laurel. Um, this had been a very physically demanding walk that day. Um, some of the women even required assistance to, to make it that far. And some of them hitched a ride, which was sort of frowned upon. Um, but finally they made it. Um, they were greeted by the Laurel mayor, George Waters in the town square, and he welcomed the women to Laurel and presented the keys of the city. Um, and later Rosalie Jones and the mayor spoke to a crowd that of reportedly a thousand people who had gathered in front of the Cloverleaf Hotel um, to see the suffragists speak. Uh, but their journey, you know, beyond the physical difficulties had not been been easy that day. Um, when passing through a village uh, reported as Winans, this is possibly the Mount Winans neighborhood in southwest Baltimore, which would have been right on their route. Um, they were met by a large party of African-American women bearing a yellow banner with votes for Negro women. Um, and the hikers were were you know, deeply alarmed at the prospect of, of being joined by these women. And they were able to, to sort of ignore them and keep marching. Um, but then later near Laurel, they were met by three uh, carriage loads full of African-American suffragists who were wearing votes for women pins and cheering. And they just sort of joined the procession into town um, as if they had been part of it all along. Um, and the, so the army also heard rumors that they would be joined the next day by an even larger group of black suffragists. And in response, uh, some of the members of the army declared that they would rather, you know, go home and end the march rather than to be humiliated, as they said, to be joined by African-American women. And when, when this happened the next day at Mirkirk, they were joined by only a small group of African-American suffragists. Um, they were just deeply rattled by this experience. And all of these incidents are um, very well recorded in the historic reporting on um, the March of the Army of the Hudson. Um, you know, as we talked about, they were very closely followed by newspaper reporters. So there's uh, a lot of evidence of these um, interactions along their path through um, Baltimore and Prince George's County. And we know, um, you know, from this that these African American suffragists were active here, and not only was the the fact that the Army of the Hudson rebuffed them just, you know, fundamentally wrong, but it also opened up the suffragists to criticism from their staunch opponents um, in the National Association opposed to woman suffrage, who used incidents like this as well as the plan to uh, segregate the national suffrage procession as evidence that the suffragists were, were um, hypocrites, which they were sort of demonstrated to be by incidents like this. And so in addition to these um, suffragists in Prince George's County, um, so, so we know they were there because we, their, um, their presence was well documented in these newspapers, but nowhere in all of the extensive documentation of these incidents do any of these reporters seem to have bothered to speak to these women to understand their motivations or even to gather their names. So in addition to the erasure of these um, to me, this episode really highlights the ways in which African American women were were erased um, in our understanding of the suffrage movement and in the historic documentation that we have available to understand it. When a newspaper, um, you know, many newspapers were covering incidents like this, but could not bother to um, report any substantive information about these women. So we simply don't have as much information about them as we do about these white suffragists. 
In addition to these women in Prince George's County, we know that there was a very active and organized African-American women's suffrage club that was formed in Baltimore City in 1915. Um, this was the Progressive Suffrage Club. They were led by Estelle Hall Young, who is in the center of the photo on the left here. Um, and they organized support for women's suffrage. And even after ratification, they worked to educate new women voters through means like an advice column in the Baltimore Afro-American, which was authored by Augusta Chassel. But overall, their work is largely, you know, overlooked and undocumented. And particularly for understanding what happened in the local movement here, many of the resources that we have simply ignored their work. The next day um, would be the last day of the march um, before the suffragists crossed into DC. And today, this day's route would bring some fresh challenges. Um, namely, um, the suffragists would have to run a gauntlet through a crowd of hostile students at the Maryland Agricultural College. So this was the, obviously the precursor to the University of Maryland in College Park. And so, Nearly 200 students gathered in an angry crowd. These were all, all men at this point, and they gathered to heckle and jeer the Army of the Hudson as they passed by. Um, and eventually they weren't satisfied by shouting at them and they physically attacked the caravan, um, tearing away suffrage banners, um, shoving some of the suffragists to the extent that um, the male reporters attached to the army um, ended up in a fist fight with the students, um, trying to, to fend them off and protect the women in the army. Um, and so you can see from, from Rosalie Jones' quote here that she was uh, not impressed with the uh, Maryland Agricultural College students. And after passing through College Park, um, the Army next um, made their way into Hyattsville, where the reception was radically different. Um, Hyattsville was extremely enthusiastic to receive the women of the Army of the Hudson. Um, the local business association reportedly placed scouts along the road so that they would have advanced warning of the Army's approach. And they laid out you know, tables and tables in a welcome feast for them. And early that morning, um, some anonymous person had climbed the water tower to paint a, a votes for women message there. So you can really see that the, uh, the attitudes varied quite a bit in different areas. By and large, the state was you know, hostile to the suffrage movement, but there were enclaves like Hyattsville where people were very excited to be part of this movement and very supportive of national actions like this. From Hyattsville, they made their final push on to Bladensburg. Um, and so they were supposedly walking through just a terrible downpour, and they ended up taking oil cloth, tablecloths and cutting out holes for their arms and heads um, that they wore as sort of makeshift ponchos as they made this last leg of the trip. And some members of the army stayed in the George Washington house, uh, which is still standing there, um, or, and others were at the Palo Alto Hotel. It seems as though they were originally meant to spend the night in Hyattsville, but there were so many curious onlookers who had traveled up from the district that there were hardly any hotel rooms to be found in the area. It was so crowded with people that some of the war correspondents even had to just sort of make camp and, and pitch a tent because there weren't any hotel rooms to be had. People uh, by this point knew that the army was on the Capitol's doorstep and there was, you know, excitement for their arrival had really risen, you know, to sort of a fever pitch. And everybody who, who could um, wanted to associate themselves in some way with this march. Um, some sort of, you know, pretended like they had joined it the whole time. Um, people just really wanted to glom onto this exciting event. Um, but unfortunately, in Bladensburg, their event was, or their journey was dealt a, a pretty demoralizing blow. Um, the Army got word that the executive committee of the National American Woman Suffrage Association, that was the you know, major prominent national suffrage group that had sponsored their march, they got word that the 
executive committee had voted that the letter to President Wilson should be delivered in a more formal manner um, and that the suffrage pilgrims would no longer have the honor of presenting it themselves. Uh, which had been the entire purpose of their journey. Um, Alice Paul came to Bladensburg that night to take the letter from Rosalie Jones, uh, which was you know, bitterly disappointing to all of the women who had made this journey. Uh, still, uh, the next day they pressed on um, to DC, um, marching down the Bladensburg Road um, to, you know, among huge excited crowds of people um, who had been waiting for their arrival and following their journey. And uh, a couple days later, they joined the big uh, March 3rd, 1913 National Suffrage Procession, along with 5,000 fellow suffragists and, and many, you know, tens of thousands in the street as spectators. Unfortunately, President Wilson did not express his support for women's suffrage until midway into his second term. Um, but the march was still really a highly influential action. Um, it spurred similar marches, um, pilgrimages, and demonstrations that used the traveling tactics of the Army of the Hudson to great effect. So later that same year, in the summer of 1913, um, national suffragists organized this Couriers to Congress campaign where women collected um, petitions to their senators from across the country and then gathered in Hyattsville at the former Hyattsville ballpark to sort of convene in a celebratory environment before they formed a caravan of automobiles and stream down to the Capitol to deliver these petitions. So um, several years ago now, we were able to place a historic marker, um, you know, sort of near the location at which this ballpark would have stood, um, which commemorates this action of the Couriers to Congress campaign that took place uh, right in Hyattsville. So that was an exciting way to um, make sure that the legacy of the suffrage movement isn't totally forgotten in our built environment, even though places like the ballpark where these actions occurred are, are no longer here. Um, in addition to, to this campaign and other national campaigns, um, the uh, March of the Army of the Hudson really spurred a lot of um, local or statewide Maryland activism. In particular, the women of the Just Government League really embraced this tactic of the, the march or the pilgrimage, pilgrimage. And they began planning these campaigns. Um, the first one was held the next year in 1914, where they would either walk, um, as you see on the left here. Um, these women uh, walked for two weeks through Garrett County in Western Maryland, um, reaching rural communities and speaking about women's suffrage. Um, and sometimes they would use this covered wagon on the right here. It's, this was called the Prairie Schooner, and it was pulled by the two suffrage mayors, Susan B. and Margaret B., named for Margaret Brent. So Maryland women really embraced these tactics as a, as a means to um, not only spread the word about suffrage, but really to gain a lot of media attention. Um, they, they said that part of the point of these was, um, one of the organizers said, to see those crazy suffragists walk. They knew that this was such an sort of odd and out there behavior that it was guaranteed to, um, to garner them some attention. Um, and th these sorts of actions were, in some ways, can be seen as uh, a precursor to even more radical tactics that women began to use as the suffrage campaign wore on without success. Um, women had grown increasingly radical and were willing to take actions that were probably seen as unthinkable just a few years uh, earlier. Um, and they began, for example, they began a picket at the gates of the White House in January of 1917. Um, they were the first people to ever picket the White House as an act of political protest. Obviously, an enduring form um, of protest, an element of our democracy that persists to this day. This um, image here shows a Maryland Day demonstration. Um, Maryland women were expected to come down and, and help out with the pickets because they were so close to the district. Uh, so Maryland women joined these protests and were arrested and jailed for their participation. Uh, Baltimorean Lucy Branham, who is seen at the center here, um, she uh, here was burning President Wilson's uh, a speech of his in Lafayette Square, and she was later imprisoned in the Occoquan workhouse. 
And so women's willingness to engage in radical actions like this, uh, including the March of the Army of the Hudson, it really moved the needle forward and finally created political change after almost 80 years of this um, suffrage movement. And women's leadership of groundbreaking campaigns for progress continued, uh, particularly for women of color who fought for another 45 years to gain equal access to voting rights with the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Um, and women continue to re remain at the forefront of campaigns for social and racial justice today, um, I think based on, on the roots that they built during the women's suffrage movement. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. That's um, fantastic. Let me um, change back over here to uh, get my webcam on. Apologies. There we go. Um, and we're going to start looking at questions. So um, what we'll do is we'll have Grace pop back in here. Um, and um, please do remember that we have the question box um, that you can use to answer questions, uh, to ask questions. Um, I'm sure that you all have uh, plenty of questions about uh, uh, Maryland and, and women's suffrage. Um, Casey, you know, I, I want to maybe just start out with um, resources um, that maybe uh, they would want to look at. I was listening today to a, a podcast with um, uh, Preservation Maryland. And that made me think of that. So some of those. And that'll give Grace a moment to continue to look at the uh, questions that are popping up. Sure. So, you know, honestly, one of the most fruitful resources that I found in, in looking at this, and in, particularly, in particular for identifying these local sites, um, was relying on local newspapers. And fortunately, um, over the past, you know, four years since I've been working on this, more and more of these local newspapers are coming online um, and are able to be searched by keyword. So you can just, you know, look for things like the Just Government League or women's suffrage. Um, the major downside of, of that as a resource is that, you know, most of the papers that we have digitized are, um, at this point in time, we're completely ignoring the lives and work of black residents. So that is, has not been a very fruitful source for identifying their work with the exception of the Baltimore Afro-American, which did profile the work of the, um, the Progressive Suffrage Club in Baltimore. Um, and as some of these additional papers have come online, um, beginning to find additional examples of African-American women su suffragists working in different parts of the state. So that's been, been really fruitful. And then the official sort of history of the National American Women Suffrage Association was recorded in a, I think, six-volume um, book written sort of contemporaneously with the movement in which they were documenting um, uh, meetings and leaders and new organizations that had formed. And all of that is also available, complete, has been completely digitized and is available online. And then finally, the last you know important resource is um, I think it's held by the Enoch Pratt Library through their Digital Maryland portal. Um, you can actually go in there and view the firsthand minutes of the Maryland Women's Suffrage Association, um, and it's it's a little hard to read. You know, it's a lot of scrolly uh, old handwriting, um, but that's a very important um, first firsthand account of the work of women suffragists in Maryland. Thanks so much, Casey. And we are getting a lot of uh, questions coming in. Um, so the first here is the Hyattsville, Hyattsville ballpark was the WSSC parking lot, right? This comes in from Q um, or all of Magruder Park. I understand. I at the time I was looking at this, I think we had the our archaeologist do some, you know, geo reference mapping, and his impression was that the approximate location of the ballpark is about right where the WSSC parking lot is today. So that's right. Okay, and then the next question here is: To what degree were the wonderfully creative tacits of the suffragists borrowed from the British suffrage movement versus their own creation? And that question comes from Ed. 
so I think this tactic in particular was was basically directly lifted from the work of the British suffragists. Uh, I think you know Rosalie Jones had really closely followed their work, and I I think that the English suffragists had previously attempted a uh, pilgrimage uh, just like this that she was emulating. Now in general the tactics that the British suffragists were using, most American women considered those too radical to use. So, um, you know, we hear these women referred to as suffragettes sometimes, and that's actually a term that was specifically applied to these militant British women who were doing things like, you know, blowing up mailboxes and setting politicians' homes on fire. Um, one woman who, who dashed out in front of the king's horse at a horse race and was trampled to death. So the British women were, I think, inspirational to American women, but frequently willing to take much um, more radical action than American women saw as, as you know, highly deviant and unacceptable. And they deliberately distanced themselves by from those women by calling themselves suffragists instead of suffragettes. This next question comes from Karen. She says, great presentation. You mentioned that George Waters in Laurel gave them the keys to the city, Laurel, the city of Laurel. Do you know where they stayed that night? We think it might be the Academy of Music in Laurel. Hmm might be so the way i've seen it describes it that they stayed they stopped at the cloverleaf hotel which i haven't been able to identify um so to me that implied that they were staying at the cloverleaf hotel but maybe that's not the case and that would be really exciting i don't know if that's a building that is still standing the music hall but if so that would be a really exciting uh, discovery All right, and why would black women be more likely to vote Republican at that time? This comes from Lynn. So this was still a time when the Republican Party was seen as the party of Lincoln, um, who had uh, done so much for emancipation and, and abolition. So at this time, you know, the vast majority of African American voters were registered as Republicans um, in reflection of that connection to, to Lincoln and his actions. Now, that, you know, began to change not even very long after ratification of the 19th Amendment. Um, in the, you know, maybe late 1920s and early 1930s, um, Maryland's political parties were still very segregated. So you had, you know, uh, colored Republicans, they call themselves, and then, you know, the white Republicans. And then very few, I think, if any African Americans were registered as Democrats because the Democratic Party was very vocally opposed to um, not just voting rights, but also promoting other um, segregationist, segregationist measures around the state. But even as early as the later 20s and 30s, you begin to see black Republicans saying like, you know, hold on, uh, we've been voting for these Republican candidates, but they're not actually doing anything to support our communities. So um, African-American communities begin to make a call for um, much more, you know, direct and active political support rather than the sort of you know, passive at best political support that they had actually been receiving from the Republican Party, certainly here in Maryland. And we do have a follow up from um, Karen. She says, we have information on the Cloverleaf, not standing, but we know of it. Um, the Academy of Music burned in 1917. Um, and it looks like she is with the Laurel Historic Society. Um, yes, so well, that's I'm, that's really interesting. You know, I that's sad to hear that that building burned, and that was really an experience that I had so many times, particularly when um, identifying these sites associated with the movement. Is that where we even had a specific location to identify? Very frequently, they had been lost um, to fire, or even, you know, many times just to demolition. And I think that's a reflection of the uh, the way in which we ignore this history for so long. Um, you know, a lot of these places are even documented 
historic sites. Some of them are on the National Register, like the Lyric, um, but none of them, none of their documentation of historic significance makes reference to the women's suffrage movement or even women just sort of broadly and the lives they lived in these places. So it's, it was, you know, sad, but no surprise to me that we had lost so many buildings like this because we hadn't thought of them as important. It's very unfortunate. Um, Lynn has a second question. She asks, how many women started the walk and how many finished? So I th approximately, I think about 225 women were attached to the Army of the Hudson, um, but not all of those were, were walkers. Um, there were women who, and, and there were men on the journey as well, who were you know, war correspondents or they drove the baggage cars. So there were people who were riding in, in vehicles along the way who were considered part of the you know, procession, but weren't actually marchers. Um, and I believe that there were about, you know, a dozen to maybe 14 women who walked the entire way, um, including Rosalie Jones and Emily Dutch um, serving as a war correspondent. So not, not that many, um, but a lot uh, who successfully made this really long journey. You know, some of these women were um, like, you know, incapacitated along the way because it was such an arduous journey and some of them just, you know, physically couldn't couldn't handle that much walking and the cold. I mean, sounds <laughs> intense. Yeah, February too. Yeah. So this question comes from Kira Lene. She asks, can you detail black women's suffrage work in Maryland? How did the Progressive Social Club materialize its vision of racial and gender justice? So the Progressive Suffrage Club was the main, was the best documented African American women's suffrage organization that I was able to find in Maryland. And they worked primarily in Baltimore City, but I understand that I have, you know, less uh, um, well documented evidence, but evidence that they went out into other parts of the state to try to seed suffrage chapters there as well. Um, these were women who had been part of earlier um, neighborhood civic and social organizations. So they were, you know, really well experienced in working on issues like, you know, school reform and air quality and, and healthy housing and, and caring for impoverished people. So it's easy to see how a commitment to women's suffrage was a, you know, extension of those commitments. Um, African-American women, were also highly involved um, throughout this time in efforts to um, support black men's voting rights. Um, in, in Maryland, you know, three times um, during this period, um, Maryland attempted to pass um, statewide um, ballot measures that would have taken the vote away from black men. So even at the same time that African-American women were organizing for their own right to vote, they were also having to actively defend voting rights for, for black men, um, knowing that without, um, if they were to lose their votes, um, they would ev have even less political power than they already did. Um, you also see, um, so the leader of the Progressive Suffrage Club, Estelle Hall Young, she really clearly articulated that you know, it was it was apparent to everybody that the efforts to um, to block voting rights were tied to suppression of of black women's votes in particular, and so she made a really um, she made some really deliberate and and bold statements saying that um, the goal of the Progressive Suffrage Club would be to really drive up voter registration um, in order to make a statement to the politicians who had tried to suppress those votes, and I. I I think, you know, based on sort of, you know, preliminary evidence, I think that their work was successful because in the, all across the state, in the um, in the weeks and months immediately following ratification, when women were registering to vote for the first time, you see local papers from you know 
the Eastern Shore, Central Maryland, a lot of different places are reporting that African American women are turning out to register in very high numbers, like far surpassing the number of, of white women who are registering to vote, which is, you know, driving up the number of registered Republican voters and has the effect of, of scaring the Democratic Party so much that they they like are act they're quoted saying like, oh, we really have to have to, you know, get on our game here, otherwise we'll be surpassed. So I think you you see in the words of Estelle Hall Young, she's um, she's quoted quite a bit in the Baltimore Afro American in reference to this work, um, as well as ongoing work in civil rights and social justice. You know, following the suffrage campaign, she makes a really clear link between women's voting rights and this broader need for uh, for racial justice in the state. Thank you. Um, so we have three questions left. This is just a reminder to our attendees, if you have a question, uh, it's not too late to enter it in the question box. Um, this next one comes from Lori and it's sort of related to the question that was just asked, were all of the Army of the Hudson women disinclined to accept African American uh, suffragettes or were some in favor of them joining the march? Were they ever, um, did they ever publicly regret their stance before they died? I don't think I have a good answer for you. Um, so as these, as these, you know, interactions are occurring in Maryland and the prospect of these, you know, African-American suffragists keeps being raised, there does seem to have been some debate among the women of the Army of the Hudson um, in which, you know, some of them were expressing these really overtly hostile positions saying like, you know, how, how offensive and humiliating it would be and that they would rather go home. Um, and, and some women, like I think Rosalie Jones manages at, you know, she just tries to not answer the question. So I think that's the best that any of them did was to, was to say like, I, I guess it's, if they want to march, they can march. Um, but in effect, um, they, they ignored these African American women when they tried to join them and successfully rebuffed them. So I I don't think that any of them were were actively welcoming these um, women to join them. Um, and I I don't think that I mean it's it's possible. I, I that's a question I don't know whether any of them um, re rejected that position later in life. I know uh, Rosalie Jones did not for the the remainder of her life. Um, and this was, you know, also tied very closely in time um, to the National Woman Suffrage Procession on March 3rd, in which African American women were asked to march at the back of the parade. Um, and, you know, Ida B. Wells and the women of um, the founding women of Delta Sigma Theta um, rejected that demand and marched um, where they where they should have in the parade. Um, but this was a very pervasive opinion that was supported at the national level of their organization. So I don't think I would be surprised, you know, given the attitudes of these women at the time, if any of them were, were, you know, openly embracing of African American women. So Kate says she really enjoyed reading the Women's Hour last year that focused on Tennessee. Are there any books that you would recommend about the Maryland side of things or the role of black suffragists? So I know um, I'll answer the, the second question first um, because it, I've seen a lot about it lately. I think, so there's a new book um, that is called Vanguard uh, that I, I think was just published, you know, very recently um, to coincide with this anniversary by Dr. Martha Jones. Um, and she um, she also had a really good piece recently in the New York Times about um, a quest to find out whether her grandmother was able to, to vote in the 1920 election or whether her vote was suppressed because she was a, a black woman living in the South. So she has written this new book, which I think has been really highly um, regarded and really well reviewed as sort of a fresh look at African American women's role in the suffrage movement. Um, but also, I, uh, this is a resource that I'm going to show you because I 
have, have it at my desk here, um, is African American Women in the Struggle for the Vote. Um, this was by Dr. Rosalind Turborg Penn, and she, uh, I think maybe this book was published in the, in the 80s, I'm not sure when it was published, but she did a lot of the really original groundbreaking research into African American women's role in the suffrage movement and was able to, um, she also talked about ways to sort of identify these uh, women's voices when they're not immediately apparent in some of these, you know, dominant sources. Um, and then in terms of Maryland, I know um, Elaine Weiss has recently written a book about um, the movement. I think she touches on on Marilyn's role, um, but I don't know of any specific like books that are specifically wholly dedicated to the women's suffrage movement in Maryland. All right, thanks. You're doing a great job of these rapid fire <laughs> questions. We're getting a lot of engagement, which is really really awesome. Um, and we have one question left. This comes from Brent. He says, "I have a brief news reference of." My great grandfather joining the march in Vansville, Berwyn. There is little on men's role in suffrage. Are there any databases of marchers now? Hmm. Um, I don't know of any any databases. I mean, I th I've never seen. You know, they say 225 people joined the march, and I've never seen a list of who all those people are. Even a much shorter list of who was involved. Um, it's possible that. Um, it might be held in records somewhere if there's an archive that houses the records of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, um, since they were the ones who organized this campaign. But it struck me as sort of a, a, a fluid event in which people were moving in and out, and some people joined the march for only short periods. Um, and those people who didn't um, make the entire journey, I would be surprised if their if their presence had really been documented in any way. Uh, so that's really exciting that you found that evidence uh, about your relative there. That's pretty cool. Um, in general, though, I think a lot of the the voices um, and names of these people have been forgotten, um, men and, and particularly women um, who frequently aren't even identified by their own names, but by their husband's names. So they are they are even harder to find in the historic record. All right, I'm going to pop back in here since that's the end of the uh, questions. Um, and um, Casey, do you want to um, let folks sort of know how they could find out more information? What's the best way if they have maybe some follow up questions? We're certainly able to route them to you if that is the most effective way. Yeah, I think that would be great if anybody has questions um, to reach out through you. And I would also direct people who are looking for more general information to the, um, there's a story map that I created uh, for the Maryland Historical Trust that's housed on their website that um, includes a really broad overview of the state's um, suffrage movement and identify some of these locations in other places around the state where um, where this work occurred. So that's a good sort of follow-up thing to look at if you're looking for more about the local movement here in Maryland. Perfect. Um, and so again, if folks uh, are looking for it, we will be posting this uh, um, presentation to YouTube um, within the next day, two days. Um, so definitely look for it uh, on our YouTube channel. If you do have questions, feel free to shoot us an email um, you can always just do info at anacostiatrails.org or info at marylandmilestones.org. They go the same place and we will get those questions off to Casey and get you an answer. Um, so one more time, I really do want to thank, um, first I'll thank Grace for managing the uh, question and answers on the back end. Thank you for that. And of course, thank you to Casey.